Okay, welcome back everyone. Today, back-to-back -back security in two talks. So I'm welcoming Rory McCune with Beyond the Surface, Exploring Attacker, Persistent Strategies in Kubernetes. So welcome. Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, so the talk today, Beyond the Surface, Attacker Persistence in Kubernetes. So a lot of security talks will often look at how do attackers break in? What are the things they're going to do to attack your applications, to attack your clusters? And what might they do afterwards? And how can you protect? The idea of this talk is instead to say, what happens after they've successfully compromised your cluster? What might they do to try and hang around? Because attackers getting initial access is just the first part of it. They want to retain access to environments. They want to continue exfiltrating all your data as long as possible. And they want to get access to as many parts of your environment as possible. And for persistence, that's what you need. The other thing I wanted to do with the talk today is talk about some of the areas of Kubernetes security that are perhaps a little bit less well known and some of the things you can do. And at the end, we will also talk a little bit about how to stop them because it wouldn't be a good security talk if I didn't you know, leave you with something useful. Who am I? Why am I doing this? Um, I have been in information and IT security for a while now. The fact I don't call it cybersecurity should give you some idea to how long I've been in. That's new, too new for me. Uh, I've been doing container security for, I believe, eight years. I didn't believe this. I went back and looked. I started doing talks on this in 2016, so yes, it has been eight years. Uh, I'm a senior security advocate for Datadog. If you've not come across Datadog, we are a SaaS provider of observability and security services. Uh, in the community, I do a couple of things. I am one of the authors of the CIS benchmarks for Docker and Kubernetes. These are vendor-neutral hardening guides. If you use CSPM software or KSPM software, you will essentially be using CIS benchmarks. You might not know it, but you are. Uh, I'm also a member of Kubernetes SIG Security and CNCF Tag Security, which if you're interested in security, well worth coming along to our meetings. And lastly, I am very proud to be a member of the only unofficial Kubernetes SIG to have ever keynoted KubeCon, which is SIG Honk. Um, and we are essentially a group of people who just like playing around with the security of clusters. Um, this talk is very much in the spirit of SIG Honk, or at least it's intended to be. So let's set the scene. There are many ways that an attacker might get access to a cluster. You might accidentally, as an admin, check your credentials into GitHub. I have seen this. It has happened. You might get malware on your laptop, and someone might know about Kubernetes credentials, and they might steal them from you. For the purposes of this story, however, our intrepid Kubernetes administrator is partaking of coffee in one of Paris's lovely cafes. They have then stepped out to take an urgent phone call outside and have unfortunately left their laptop unlocked. And very unfortunately for them, there are some shady attacker types who are waiting for this because KubeCon is in town this week and they thought here's an opportunity to get access to some clusters. And they have stolen the administrator's credentials and they have half an hour, the duration of this talk, to try and persist in the cluster and to try and creep access. So let's think about what they could do. Well, the first thing they want to do is they want access to one of the cluster nodes, right? Because once we've got access to a cluster node, we can start running our own code. So how are they going to do that? Well, we also have to think about where they're going to hide, though. Because they might hide in the cluster, they might hide in the container, and they might hide in the node. There's lots of places to hide. Um, we're not going to talk about cloud today, because I could do a whole talk just on cloud, probably do several talks on cloud. We are going to focus on clusters, nodes, and containers. But how are they going to get access initially? Well, in my old pen tester days, I used to have a, a manifest I used a lot. I called it PrivPod. And it basically gave me full access to a cluster node by running a pod manifest. It was based on, if anyone's ever seen, Ian Meal did a blog called The Most Useless Docker Container Everywhere. Any, it was 2015. The most useless Docker container. It was my favorite Docker container as a pen tester. It was one command that basically drops you in a privileged container with all the host namespaces. Fantastic stuff. Then Kubernetes came out with kubectl debug node. And I was thought, wow, this is my pen test script. It literally is a manifest that does the exact same thing as I did with a pen tester. It drops you into a privileged shell on the node. So our attackers can just use that. If I'm a cluster admin, I can just do kubectl debug node, and I then have a privileged container with access to host namespaces. So the first step in, in persisting access is pretty simple. I can get access to kubectl debug, and away I go. One thing I always remember when I've done, used to do a lot of cluster reviews, is that sometimes people would say, we've locked down the access to the cluster. We've removed all SSH access. We only give people kubectl access now. And I had to give them the kind of bad news that that's basically the same thing. In a lot of ways, that's actually more powerful than just SSH access. 
But that's what our attackers are going to do. They're going to use kubectl debug node, getting them a privileged container. Next thing, we want to retain access. Well, there's, this is kind of a fairly basic and, and obvious technique. We've all been told you don't use password logins for SSH anymore. You use authorized keys, right? We use key-based login. If I'm an attacker and I have a root shell in the node, I can just concatenate a key onto the end of authorized keys for any user. And at that point, I can then SSH to the node as them. Now, of course, SSH, as I said, may not be exposed to the internet, but it might be. It's not unknown. And if it is, that's my access, right? I just put a key on the end of SSH keys, and away you go. But even if SSH isn't exposed to the internet, this technique is actually pretty useful for a reason I'm going to explain in the next slide. This one, I would hope, I mean, I'm hoping everyone's running node security agents on all their clusters, right? If you are, I would hope this got spotted. If it doesn't spot this, that's probably not great, because like I said, it's a classic technique. It gives attackers persistent access. So this one, you know, I'd hope they're gonna spot it. So now I have access, my attackers, so they've got access to the node, they've got their debug shell, and they've got their key and SSH authorized keys. They're well on the way to keeping and persisting their access to the cluster. But the next thing they need to do is they need to execute code. My, if I'm an attacker, I want to actually execute code inside the cluster node, because that's going to help me persist. It's going to help me do things like call back to my command and control systems. Now, as an attacker, you might just think, well, I'll just run a binary on my cluster node. And that may or may not work, because a lot of Kubernetes distributions have actually started locking down node operating systems and actually removing the ability of people just to run any binary on a node operating system. I mean, I'm using GKE for all my demos today, um, just because it's the one I had access to. But I noticed GKE are now using container-optimized Linux on their nodes by default. And if you try and just drop a binary somewhere and run it, you're probably gonna run into the fact they've run no exec on the file system mount, or they've got it read-only, so you can't do that. So to an extent, attacker's life may be more difficult, but our attackers here, they are container-aware. And they thought, well, it's a Kubernetes node, and it's got a container runtime on it. That means I can always run containers, right? If I've got a Kubernetes node, there's no time I won't be able to run containers because that's literally what Kubernetes nodes do. So I can just run a new container in order to persist my access. Um, and to do this, I'm going to make use of a, a perhaps lesser known feature, which is container D namespaces. So if you don't know about container D namespaces, they let you organize all your containers into different sets. Um, if I create my own namespace, then my container won't be visible if you just look at all the ones, for example, in the kates.io namespace. You won't see my container running because it's in a different one. Somewhat confusingly, container D namespaces have nothing to do with Kubernetes namespaces and nothing to do with Linux namespaces. So naming is definitely hard because everyone uses the thing namespaces and they all mean something different. So I can actually do that. So let's, in the spirit of, let's see how the dark gods of demos are treating me today, let's do this live. So I have got my access to my GKE and I've got my debug shell which I've got ready to go. Now the first thing is, I'm in a privileged container. So could I run CTR, which is what I'm gonna to use, to launch a new container from my debug shell? And the answer is no, you can't. In the old days, I hate saying old days for this, when Docker was our CRI of choice, if you had access to the socket file, you could always use Docker to hit the socket file and run a new container. If you try running, accessing the container D socket from inside a container, you're gonna have a bad time because it relies on the client having certain things in common with the server, and it won't work. There are, I've seen like an idea of a really weird container that you could run that will run containerd inside it, but nope. It's not a good, it's not easy. So what I'm gonna do is, I did SSH authorized keys. So let's go and get a full proper shell. We'll just SSH back to ourselves. 127001, easy. Awesome, we're on, and we can just do sudo bash, because I picked a user who's got sudo bash rights. Now we've got a real proper full shell. I can do whatever I want. So let's, because I'm not as brave as Victor, I'm not going to try typing all of my commands. I'm going to copy paste them. I'm gonna create a new container namespace, and I'm gonna use CTR as my client. So I could use nerdcuttle, but nerdcuttle doesn't come with containerd. One of the great things about CTR is it's in, included with every single containerd installation. As an attacker, the fewer things I download, the less chances there are that someone's going to detect what I'm up to. So I'll use CTR. So I create a new namespace. I'm gonna call it sysnetmon. Let's not make it obvious. Let's not call it attacker was here or something. Let's call it sysnetmon. Then what I can do is I can go and pull an image. So I'm just gonna pull an image off Docker Hub. Um, and I'm gonna call it systemdnetmon. If I had a bit more time, I would have changed my name as well, call it systemdnetmon. Now th this, this image has nothing to do with systemd. It's got nothing to do with network monitoring either. 
Docker tags can be anything you want them to be. They don't describe what is in the image. But my attacker is going to call it that. So cool, I now have my image downloaded locally. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it. So let's clear that off, put that in. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, that's when it's decided it doesn't want to be exactly right. Let's try that again. Do, do, do. Uh, where, what's it done run wrong? I know what it's done wrong. It has decided to break it on a new line, which it should not have done. There we go. Awesome. I now have my container running. Now, that container did a couple of useful, interesting things. One, it uses host networking. So it now is not restrained by network policies. You've got network policies in your cluster. They don't generally apply to host networking. Um, it also mounts the entire file system from the node inside the container as slash host. This means I've got access to everything there is on the node file system as an attacker, including things like the kubelet creds. So I now have access to anything the kubelet on that node can do, I can do, because I have got access to the kubeconfig file that it uses. I also probably have access to every single secret for any container on that node, because I've got access to all the file systems where those secrets live. So as an attacker, this is a good first step. I've got access to quite a lot of useful stuff. Um, and I can actually then just execute a shell inside my container. Awesome. So I'm now running in a container. I can pull any code I like down to this because I'm running in my own container. And I can run it. And there's nothing that you know, read-only file systems are not going to block me. No exec is not going to block me because I'm running a container. As an attacker, my day is getting better. So what are we going to do next? What's our next step? We could have done this a different way, just to mention before I move on. We could have used Kubernetes static manifests. These are a really useful tool for Kubernetes. They're used as part of the bootstrap process. So before the Kubernetes API is up and running, if the kubelet wants to start a container, for example, in kubeadm, all of the control plane components get started this way, you use a static manifest. You basically put a pod manifest into a directory, and it runs it. You can also amusingly put it at a URL. The kubelet has the facility to read static manifests from a URL if you want it to. Um, which is another nice way of doing it. But as an attacker, if I just dump a pod manifest in, then it will dump, it will, the kubelet will handle running it. And the kubelet will handle things like restarts. So you know, if the node gets restarted, the kubelet will say, yeah, of course, I'll just restart that thing for you. So again, the attacker could have gone down the static manifest line. There's different ways of doing it depending on you know, how he wants to work. This time, we've just gone for CTR. That's another way of handling it. So now I need to get access back out. I need to do a reverse shell. I need some way of saying, once my credentials are no longer valid, I can still get back into this environment from anywhere in the world. Now, there's lots of software out there. There's lots of attacker software you could use to use this. There's Cobalt Strike. There's Metasploit. There's lots and lots of them. Most of attack software or pen test software will get picked up by anti-malware agents or XDR systems or EDR systems. What might not is TailScale. TailScale is an amazing piece of software. I love TailScale. Um, it's so useful. But one of the things you can do with TailScale is you can have it run just over 443 TCP. So you can say, if I execute TailScale inside container, it just has to be able to get to what they call their DERP network, which is a network of relays that TailScale maintain on the internet. Or you can run your own DERP server if you want. And then as long as my attacker VM can get to it over 443 TCP, and my node, essentially, because we're using host networking, can get to it over 443 TCP, I can retain access. Another fun thing you can do with TailScale is you can rename the binaries. So you could call them system dnetmon. And then if someone does a process list on the node, they'll just see that system dnetmon is running. The question I would have is, does everyone know all the processes that are meant to run on their node? Like if you looked at a Kubernetes node for a managed distribution, would you know what all of those processes did? Would you spot it if something called system dnetmon was running? I'm not sure I would. Um, but we can do that. TailScale, I'm going to put a blog. I didn't have time, unfortunately, for the demo for this. I will write a blog with exactly how you can do this, because TailScale has some really neat features, like access control lists, so your controller can talk to the bots, but the bots can't get back out. It's, it's really quite nice. There will be a blog coming on that one. But we can use that, right? So now we have executed code in our thing. We've got our container running, and we have our persistent access. So once we get kicked off our half an hour, not even half an hour now, he's got 15 minutes left to go. Once we get past our 15 minutes, we're still going to retain access. This is all cool, but we're missing something. Because we've, I've said that the admin's credentials are going to expire in 15 minutes. We haven't got any creds. That's a problem. We need creds, because otherwise we're going to have a bad time. How can we get creds? And how can we find some nice way of perhaps getting access to Kubernetes functionality without being spotted? Here, we come to the Kubelet API. Kubelet API is great fun. Um, 
The Kubel API essentially runs on every single node, 10 to 50 TCP, um, and it lets you do fun things like execute commands on every single container running on the node, which is really nice. The Kubel API is also interestingly in that it's not actually documented really anywhere. Um, there is some documentation if you know where to look or the source code if you want to go and look, but it's not that heavily used. From an attacker's perspective, there's two very interesting properties that the Kubel API has. It is not in the audit log. If you do stuff with the Kubel API, the audit log does not capture it. It will capture the request for a check for credentials, but it won't capture what was done. So that's useful as an attacker, because I don't like audit logs, because people might find me if I turn up in those. Um, it also doesn't affect my admission control. Admission control does not affect the Kubel API. So if you're using admission control to stop people doing things, if someone can go to the Kubel API, then they're, they're, they're good. So the question, of course, is for my attacker, how do I get access to this Kubel API? What credentials do I need? The answer turns out to be some, somewhat not that well known, perhaps. You need access to sub-objects of Node in the main Kubernetes API. So there is a page on this on the Kubernetes docs, but the main one is Node Proxy. If I have a user that has Node Proxy rights, or you have any user that has rights to Node Proxy, you can talk to the Kubernetes API directly, bypassing the main Kubernetes API. There are some legitimate software that uses this, but we can use this as attackers too. So let's see if we can actually do that. For this, I'm going to go back out to another shell on my attacker machine that has got creds. And we are going to go to our next command. So I'm going to create a set of credentials, and I'll explain how I did this on the next slide. But I'm basically going to create a set of credentials for a user called kubeapi server. This is a user that's part of GKE, so every distribution tends to have different users that are defined in it. I found one that was useful for this demo. It's called uh, kubeapi server. Doesn't exist in other demos, but there's usually some user you can use for this. This one's got node proxy rights. So we're just gonna create a new kubeconfig file for that. So we've done that, awesome. We're now going to cat out that kubelet user file. And if I was using my tail scale out lock setup, I would, I'd bring this across with that. But instead, what I'm gonna do, if I can persuade this to copy. I know, it's a nice little kubeconfig. That, that's got a, uh, uh, I'll explain how that worked in a second. Uh, there we go, we're going to control C that, and then we're going to go back into our shell, in, so we're back inside our cluster, and I'll just call it kubelet user config, and then we'll just paste that in, and then we'll do escape, quit. And then once I've got that, so I've now got my kubelet config file, oops, we're going to go back to our text file, and we're going to get, do, do, do that command. Right. Ah. Even with the power of copy and paste, I can still make a mess of it. Uh, oh, I called it the wrong thing. Okay, awesome. That did not do what I wanted it to. Uh, oh, I know what happened. I scrolled down too far. Awesome, that's better. So this is a command called kubelet cuttle. If you want to get to the kubelet API, you could do it manually with curl, or you can use kubelet cuttle. And that is a kubelet cuttle list of all of the pods running on that node. So I've got credentials now, which give me access to that node and all the pods running on it. The good thing about those credentials is they also give me access to every other node and all of the pods running on it too. So I've got 100 nodes, the same credentials would work, and I would have access to do don't just list the pods, but execute code inside every pod in the container. So as an attacker, I'm having a pretty good day at this point. I've got, I've got access to run, you know, execute commands every time. And, and we're, a colleague of mine was saying to me, well, Rory, how did you do that? How did you create those credentials? Because famously, Kubernetes doesn't have a user database. But Kubernetes does have users, and you can create new ones just using Kubernetes functionality. How we're going to do this is the CSR API. Certificate Signing Request API. Um, this allows you to create new credentials for any existing user who's defined in RBAC, or actually ones that aren't, and it just won't work. But basically, it lets you create new certificate users for any user in the cluster. Um, this is enabled by default in Kubernetes, and it's always there. Interestingly, from a, um, from a security standpoint, this would go in audit logging, as long as you're logging requests to this API but there's nowhere else in the cluster that this information is retained. So once I create a credential, if you don't have audit logging turned on, there's no information that I created the credential. 
I can also create credentials for any user, and I can create as many credentials as I want. So I can have 10 credentials all for the same account. No problem at all. Works just fine. And this is part of how Kubernetes has, this is one of the APIs Kubernetes has. So you might say, you've gone to a lot of effort there, Rory. Uh, you've had to create containers, you've had to like copy and paste credentials, you've got the Kubernetes API. Is there an easier way? Well, if the API server is exposed to the internet, then you can just create credentials using the CSR API and use them over the internet. Now, would anyone ever put their API server on the internet? Last I looked, there's 1.4 million Kubernetes API servers on the internet. Um, because the default in all of the major managed distributions, GKE, AKS, EKS, is to put the API server on the internet. And somewhat unsurprisingly, people tend to follow defaults. If you read the hardening guides for all of those distributions and any other one, they'll typically say don't do that. But the default is that's what you get. So as not a surprise, there's lots of them on the internet. There are various search engines that you can use to find them. If, I've got, if your cluster is on the internet, all you need to do is use the CSR API to create a credential, and then it'll give you what you want. And I've got a little demo of that. So let me get to the, back to my demo script. And here we go here. So what I'm going to do is we'll go back to this shell here. And then we'll do that. And we're just going to use this command here. This is something I wrote because I'm a lazy pen tester. Um, you can manually use kubectl to use the CSR API. I got tired of doing it manually, so I just created a little program there, which is the Gaelic for certificate. Um, and what it does is it uses the CSR API, issues a new credential, and then creates a kubeconfig file for me. Because it just literally automates three commands. It's nothing magic. And I'm going to create a new, I'm going to use a different user account this time. I'm going to use system GKE common webhooks. Uh, and I'm going to output to a file called webhook.config. Now, an important point about this credential as it gets created is the expiry date, which is 2029. So by default, in GKE, you get five years validity. This credential will last till 2029. This is variable depending on the distribution. Uh, AKS, I seem to recall, being one or two years. But it, it's a while. It, it's not that short. Um, so you get access, and also to revoke this credential, if you, for example, knew it had been created, you have to rotate the certificate authority for the entire cluster, assuming that you can do that. Uh, in AKS, they note this as being possible and say it's a disruptive operation that will take the cluster offline for like 15 minutes. So it's not something you're probably going to do too lightly. But as an attacker, this is great. I can now create a credential called G System GKE Common Webhooks, and any access in the audit log comes from System GKE Common Webhooks. So all you will see is requests to that, request, to that endpoint, or from that user, essentially. An important point to note, though, there are two places where this doesn't work. Amazon EKS, they disabled this API. For a long time, it was not documented why they had disabled this API. There was just a GitHub issue with people saying, hey, this broke my stuff. Um, eventually, they put it in the docs to say this is deliberate. We, have no, we don't allow this for creating credentials that can be used to authenticate to the cluster. We, use, we have other uses of it, but not that. They've never said why, but I'm pretty sure the answer is security. The other one is GKE Autopilot. GKE Autopilot tries to block this. It takes a different approach. If I try to use this exact command on Autopilot, it'll fail because I'm trying to create a certificate for a system account. It'll say, no, you can't do that. You can start cancel, I think, create them for other users. I haven't dug into exactly what their block list looks like, mainly because I can't find exactly where their block list is documented. Um, but that is blocked there as well. So I think there's a perception, at least in some distributions, that the CSR API is a wee touch on the dangerous side. Um, but however, in the vast majority of clusters, if you're cluster admin, that works just fine. And you get your credential that lasts till 2029, which is very nice. Or, 20, or you can generally specify a max time. There can be a restriction on it, but it's typically measured in years. The best practice um, is obviously not to do this. If you have to use client certificates, make them short-lived. But again, defaults matter. And if the default is years, it's going to be years. So I have got, I think, just over five minutes left. Yes, five minutes. Okay, we're doing well on time. Awesome. Um, another way of doing this, there is another way of creating credentials in Kubernetes. Token request API. Token request API it can be used to create service account tokens. In the old days of Kubernetes, again, I hate saying old days because it's 122 or earlier, which doesn't feel that old to me, service accounts got unexpiring secrets. If you still have any 122 or earlier clusters, that's not cool because essentially if you can get access to secrets in an earlier cluster, you get tokens that never expire for any system account. You just dump the secrets once, walk away, you've got all the tokens, you can come back whenever you like, no problem. It's better now because you have to use the token request API to create them. Um, however, that is something that works as well. So I've got another one that, that 
I've got another tool that essentially creates cube config files in the same style. Um, this is not as good from an attacker's perspective because gen there can be a maximum time limit. So for example, GKE limits you to 48 hours. So the attacker has to come back every 48 hours, create a new one. EKS is 24 hours. You have to come back every 24 hours and do a new one. So it's a bit more visible, a bit less useful. Um, AKS, actually, I think last time I checked was a year. So they don't have the same set of restrictions. So one of the problems about talking about Kubernetes security is which distribution and which version am I talking about matters. But typically, that will work. Also, GKE Autopilot, credit to them. If you try and do that for Kube system accounts, it'll say, no, go away. You can't do that. Autopilot, again, recognizes this as, as a bad thing. However, if you're on the internet, um, and again, 1.4 million clusters, this will work in the vast majority of them. So you can just create a new Kube config file. My favorite service account, and I know it sounds really sad to say I have a favorite Kubernetes service account, is the, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I know. It, it's the cluster role aggregation controller service account. Because it has, and again, sad, my favorite Kubernetes verb in its RBAC, which is escalate. The escalate verb in RBAC says I can get to be whoever I want. If I, if I have escalate verb, I get to be cluster admin anytime I like. That is the thing that has the escalate verb. It has to have the escalate verb to do its job. So it will always have the escalate verb. So if you get a copy of its service account token, you have cluster admin. Simple as that. So three minutes. OK, we're, we're at the, the good part. I'm going to tell you how to stop all of this, um, kind of. So how do you detect this? How would you spot people doing this? First up, Kubernetes audit logs. I hope we all have Kubernetes audit logs turned on on all of our clusters. If you don't, there's lots of things I've done today you will just not spot. You won't see the CSR API. You won't see the token request API. Like this, there's no persistent record that those have been used. Kubernetes doesn't have user accounts. It won't tell you how many credentials there are for a given user. You can't do it. You must have audit logging turned on. Retention is important. If you want to go back further, you have to have the right retention. Now, note with managed Kubernetes, you can't change the configuration of auditing. They will detect most of this. The only downside to that is you might gather a lot more than you want. And obviously, there's a cost implication there. I don't want to pretend that's simple. Uh, there's a cost implication to retaining audit logs. But if you want to spot what people have done, then that's what you need. Uh, node agents, um, you need to run a node agent. right? If you want to spot things like adding keys to authorized keys, you need something running on the node that knows what to look for. Very importantly, um, whilst there are bypasses that can detect things, make sure whatever you're using knows about Kubernetes, or you'll get tons of false positives. Because containers do lots of odd things as far as standard Linux is concerned. So unless your node agents know what Kubernetes is and what Docker is, they will make mistakes. And you'll get a wave of false positives, and you'll turn it off. Node logs, make sure you're logging all the things from your processes, and make sure the logs don't stay on the host. Because if I'm an attacker, one of the first things I might do is just delete all the logs on the host. And then you'll, so make sure those are getting streamed somewhere central. And know what good looks like. So if someone ran a new thing on your cluster nodes called system DNet mod, would you notice that's not meant to be there? This is tricky right enough, because when you go to each distribution, they have their own range of things that run, right? GKE has its own range of things, which is different from EKS, which is different from AKS. So it's not as easy as it sounds. It sounds super simple, that, but actually worth doing. Benchmarking what you expect to be running gives you some better chance at saying this is, shouldn't be running. How do you block it? Take your clusters off the internet. I keep looking at this, and it's kind of powering out at, at 1.4 million, so I'm hoping that's people taking my advice. Take your clusters off the internet. It's not their fault, but it's well worth doing. And least privilege. Try not to use cluster admin for all your admins. Imagine this story, except the admin wasn't cluster admin. Maybe he only had rights to like debug pods, and he had a break glass procedure if he needed something else. Right? This story could have ended very differently. To use the great words of Ian Coldwater, we are all made of stars, but your RBAC should not be. And that's my talk. <laughs>